world news tonight. Smog emergency. Plumes of smog continues to pose health hazards in Lahore, Pakistan. Historic visit. Anthony Albanese becomes the first Australian Prime Minister to visit China in seven years. Hit and run. Stanford Muslim student falls victim to a hate crime on campus in California, USA. Ballet anniversary. The National Ballet of Cuba celebrates 75 years of life with a magnificent tribute gala. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and thank you for joining us for World News. We begin tonight's broadcast with an alarming smog update from Pakistan. The city of Gardens in Lahore is reeling from the latest spell of heavy smog. The city has steadily maintained the record for being the most polluted city this year as well. These revelations have been made in a research published by the University of Chicago, according to which the average age of the people of Lahore has started to decrease. It further says that the average life of people in the city is decreasing by seven years every year. Doctors, on the other hand, advise people to take precautionary measures by avoiding travelling unnecessarily and recommended using face masks if travelling was inevitable. The report also claims that for children, ingesting the current pollution levels is equivalent to smoking 30 cigarettes a day. According to Pakistan's Environment Department, the air quality index levels between 200 and 300 will start causing irritations in the eyes. Moreover, if the air quality index reaches the level of 400 to 500, it will be deemed extremely dangerous. If the AQI crosses the level of 500, it affects even healthy people. The level of smog has increased by more than 500 in different areas of Lahore these days. Environment Director Nasim Shaha told local media that since 2015, smog has been getting worse with each passing year and the government needed to do more than making tall claims. Moving on to Nepal, where search and rescue operations continue after a magnitude 5.6 earthquake damaged the northwest of the country last week. Nepal's authorities scrambled to rush aid to people as the quake killed at least 157 people and left a trail of destruction in the Himalayan nation's mountainous region. A massive and deadly quake hit Nepal on Saturday. Authorities feared the death toll could climb steeply. The population around the epicenter, in the hilly area of Jarjakot in the country's west, is scattered in remote villages that were hard for rescuers to reach. Nepalese Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal visited survivors in Jarjakot. The quake struck near midnight on Friday into Saturday in a district 300 miles west of the capital Kathmandu. Landslides have blocked roads, complicating search and rescue efforts. The tremor registered magnitude 6.4 on the Richter scale with Nepal's National Seismic Authority, while the US Geological Survey pegged it lower it is the country's deadliest tremor since 2015, when Nepal was hit by two earthquakes that killed about 9,000 people. Whole towns, temples and other historic sites were destroyed in the Himalayan country, at an economic cost of at least $6 billion. Israel Hamas war updates now. The Israeli military says Gaza City has been fully surrounded and that the Gaza Strip has been split in two. Meanwhile, Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that Israel refuses to implement a ceasefire until all the hostages are released. The Israel Defense Forces said Sunday that it had fully surrounded Gaza City and split Gaza into two. According to IDF spokesperson Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari, the Gaza Strip is now split into North Gaza and South Gaza, adding that there are now widespread strikes on terror infrastructure below ground and above it. Hagari called the encirclement of Gaza City a significant stage in the war between Israeli forces and Hamas militants as it's now able to pinpoint operations deeper within Gaza. Despite international calls for a humanitarian ceasefire, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reiterated on Sunday that there will be no ceasefire until all hostages are returned first. I want you to know that there's one thing that we won't do. 
There won't be a ceasefire without the return of our hostages. Take it completely out of the lexicon. We say it to our enemies and to our friends, and we'll simply carry on until we win. We don't have an alternative. Meanwhile, Iran warned Sunday that the U.S. will be hit hard if there is no ceasefire. According to the Iranian defense minister, Tehran's message to the Americans was to immediately stop the war in Gaza and implement a ceasefire without further elaborating on the repercussions. Iran considers the U.S. to be militarily involved in the armed conflict. The White House, on the other hand, says hostage negotiations are taking place and added that fighting may be paused to ensure their safe movement. Deputy National Security Advisor Jonathan Feiner said negotiations are taking place quietly behind the scenes and that Washington believes there is an opportunity to release a significant number of hostages. When asked if Israel would agree to a ceasefire, Feiner added that the U.S. will work hard to make it happen. Latest developments in the Russia-Ukraine war next. According to the Ukrainian authorities, dozens suffered injuries throughout the city of Russia's airstrikes on the city of Odessa and all were said to be hospitalized. The Ukrainian Air Force said that Russia launched a total of 22 drones to attack Ukraine overnight, without specifying how many of them targeted Odessa. The missiles hit Odessa's Senti Center and an abandoned industrial building, while the blast wave damaged the Odessa Fine Arts Museum, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. On the street near the museum, the attack left several meter hole. Also, Ukrainian president called for further U.S. war funding, warning that Russian victory would spell war for U.S. soldiers in NATO countries, and invited former U.S. President Donald Trump to visit and see the conflict for himself. Zelensky further said that if Russia were allowed to win the war in Ukraine, it would not stop its aggression and become emboldened and begin to attack NATO countries. In other related news now, Australia's Anthony Albanese has touched down in Shanghai, China. He is the first Australian Prime Minister to visit China in seven years. It is a crucial visit aimed at repairing relations between the two nations. Sunrise over Shanghai and what both governments hope is a new dawn for Australian-Chinese relations. We encourage uh, positive relations. This is a market of 1.4 billion people. China will always stand on the right side of history, Premier Li Chung said, opening an import summit. We resolutely oppose protectionism. The Prime Minister today on show, along with hundreds of Australian businesses, among them crayfish and beef producers, still hurting because of Chinese protectionism and tariffs. Last year, our trade with China was $299 billion. Uh, we think we can build on that. That means more Australian jobs at a time when unemployment is low but cost of living remains high and the RBA rates decision is days away. No doubt they have been working through the inflation data and weighing that up against the evidence that our economy is slowing and some of this global uncertainty. Australians want us to focus on them uh, and particularly the cost of living crisis that they're feeling out there at the moment. Last night, for the first time in seven years, Australia's Prime Minister stepping foot in China. Our flags flying side by side, even if our nations aren't quite yet eye to eye. China is still the number one source of espionage risk for Australia. They're the number one source of foreign interference in our democracy. What he can expect from me is a continuation of the patient, calibrated and deliberate way of engaging and what I expect from President Xi uh, is the same. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Now the latest on the road to the White House. As a very close U.S. election is less than a year away. According to New York Times, Siena College Paul's incumbent U.S. President Joe Biden is trailing his predecessor and likely Republican opponent Donald Trump in key swing states. Let's take a look. New U.S. presidential election polls out on Sunday showed Joe Biden trailing his predecessor, Republican frontrunner Donald Trump. 
in five of the six most important battleground states 12 months ahead of election day. The polls were conducted by the New York Times and Siena College. They showed Trump with the lead in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada and Pennsylvania, while Biden is ahead in Wisconsin. Presidential elections are often determined by the outcomes in a handful of so-called swing states, which could swing and be won by either major party, and which become targets of both of their campaigns. Trump bagged all six of the swing states in play this year when he won the presidency in 2016. Biden was able to flip five of those states in 2020, which sealed his victory then. He will need to do that again to win re-election. Responding to the polls, the Biden campaign said, quote, predictions more than a year out tend to look a little different a year later. They added, we'll win in 2024 by putting our heads down and doing the work, not by fretting about a poll. Biden's multiracial and multi-generational coalition appears to be fraying, though, according to the polls. Young voters under 30 favor Biden, who is 80 by only a single percentage point. The Democrats' lead among Hispanic voters is down to single digits, while black voters, a core Biden demographic, now registered 22 percent support in the swing states for Trump. The New York Times says that's a level unseen for a Republican candidate in modern times. Over in the U.S., authorities have opened a hate crime investigation after a student was injured in a hit and run on the Stanford University campus. All campuses across the U.S. remain to be on edge following heightened violence in Israel and Gaza. Authorities in California have opened a hate crime investigation into a hit and run that injured an Arab Muslim student at Stanford University. The student, Abdul Wahab Omera, stating, I never imagined becoming the victim of a hate-driven attack. Omera alleging that on Friday afternoon, a vehicle driven by an individual who had previously shown animosity towards my community struck me intentionally. Omera saying the driver screamed, expletive, you and your people. I went and visited him in the hospital yesterday. Uh, he, he's in good spirits, but uh, physically uh, he wasn't doing very well. Stanford University police say the student described the driver as a white male in his mid-20s with short, dirty blonde hair and a short beard, wearing a gray shirt and round-framed eyeglasses. And that the university is continuing to work to provide a safe and secure campus environment in the context of heightened tensions related to the events in Israel and Gaza. For weeks, federal authorities have warned about an increase in threats against Jewish, Muslim and Arab communities. No person and no community in this country should have to live in fear of hate-fueled violence. But campuses across the nation remain on edge. At Bucknell University in central Pennsylvania, a swastika was recently found in a residence hall. I think it just makes me feel really unsafe. The university stating hateful speech, acts or symbols have no place at Bucknell and will carry consequences. And on Friday, Cornell University canceled classes just days after Patrick Dye, a 21 year old junior, was arrested and charged for threatening to kill and injure Jewish students online. Tech mogul Elon Musk has launched Grok, a rival AI bot challenging ChatGPT and others. Musk's artificial intelligence startup Shai will be integrated into his social media platform X and will also be available as a standalone app. Elon Musk is just back from an AI summit in the UK. There he talked to British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak about the dangers posed by the tech. I'm saying this is something we should be quite concerned about because um, if the robot can, robot can follow you anywhere then, you know, what if they just one day get a software update and they're not so friendly anymore? Um, then we've got a James Cameron movie on our hands. Worries about Terminators aren't stopping him pressing ahead with his own AI plans, however. On Sunday, the billionaire said he would integrate his XAI startup into X, the social network formerly known as Twitter, which he bought last year. Musk launched XAI in July as a rival to Google's Bard and Microsoft's Bing AI. He says it is a maximum truth-seeking model, which will try to understand the nature of the universe. Musk says XAI has also launched its first bot, dubbed Grok. 
It's been available to all Premium Plus subscribers on X since Friday, and is meant to answer queries with a little wit. Musk says Grok has real-time access to information via the X platform, giving it a big advantage over rivals. X remains separate from XAI, but the two work closely together. Germany's Hamburg airport reopened yesterday, hours after a hostage standoff that involved a child was put to an end. Germany's Hamburg airport was able to reopen and restart service on Sunday, hours after a hostage standoff involving a child was over. Police arrested a 35-year-old man and rescued a 4-year-old girl, who is the daughter of the suspect and was thought to be involved in a custody dispute. Police said a man who was suspected of carrying a gun and possibly explosives drove a vehicle through the gates of the airport on Saturday night. The incident shut down one of Germany's busiest aviation hubs. The suspect eventually got out of his car with his daughter, police said, and was arrested without resistance. The girl appeared to be unharmed. The episode raised concerns over security at the airport. Less than four months ago, climate activists had been able to breach barriers and get onto a runway, blocking planes from takeoff. Welcome back. Air quality worsens across India. For more on that story and more, let's take it around the world in a minute. One of India's most iconic landmarks, the Taj Mahal, was veiled in a thick blanket of smog as toxic seasonal pollution shocks cities across India. Tokyo authorities held a missile evacuation drill today to help residents get ready amid growing concerns of the North Korea's test launches of ballistic missiles. Unseasonably cold weather and blizzards hit northeast China today as several cities issued heightened weather alerts and warned people to stay indoors. A caravan of at least hundreds of migrants left from the southern Mexican city of Tapachula yesterday, heading for the U.S. southern border. Nearly 50,000 students in Portland, Oregon, are waiting to see if they will be back at school next week as Portland public schools strike continues. That is all we have for you on World News tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight in Havana, Cuba, as the National Ballet of Cuba celebrated its 75th anniversary, with performances culminating in a tribute to its late founder, Alicia Alonso. Thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your night.